Okay, let me get started with an introduction as people are still trickling in. The actual talks will start in an extra minute or two. So on behalf of the entire US Ocean Atmosphere Interaction Committee, I'm really happy to warmly welcome you to this fourth installment of the SOLAS seminar series. And today's seminar is on the ABCs of the sea surface microlayer, aerosols, bubbles, and composition. So if that's what you wanted to hear, you're in the right place. This seminar series was arranged. I'm just here, Jan and I are here, sort of the faces of the Ocean Atmosphere Interaction Committee, but the whole committee put together this seminar series. And the Ocean Atmosphere Interaction Committee is a committee in the United States that's sponsored by the Ocean Carbon Biogeochemistry Office, so that's a lot of words, that is affiliated to our committee, which we call the OAIC, is affiliated with International SOLAS, but we're a little broader than that. We're really concerned with promoting research and community for US scientists who study all sorts of different air-sea interactions and processes. And we're very grateful for the National Science Foundation and NASA for supporting OCB and for supporting our committee. In 2021, last year, working with the, the sort of broader US SOLAS community, we wrote a new US SOLAS science plan that has ideas that stemmed from a workshop that the OAIC put on a few years earlier. The workshop was prior to, to COVID, so it took a little bit extra time to get the science plan out. But our science plan, and I think the link, May is going to pop the link for the science plan into the chat if you're interested in it, is really the sort of US vision fitting within SOLAS, what we see as the sort of highest priorities for research and what US researchers sort of convened on as topics we'd like to study. And as well as talking about the five central SOLAS themes, we also have a section where we talk about a number of cross-cutting themes that the US researchers identified as particular of interest. And one of those cross-cutting themes is the sea surface microlayer. So when we were approached to sponsor this SOLAS workshop, we really wanted to highlight our science plan. We're very proud of it. And we wanted to pull out one of these themes, hence the sea surface microlayer. The sea surface microlayer is really a great topic because it's related to sort of all five SOLAS themes because it modulates the transfer of mass across the interface. It produces aerosols, there's photochemistry, all sorts of different biogeochemical and physical interactions. The sea surface microlayer, though fascinating it is, as it is, is just one of our themes. So we definitely encourage you to check out our SOLAS plan, whether a US researcher or not, to see some of the other themes and processes that we've identified. So today, as I said, our topic is the ABCs, the aerosols, bubbles, and composition. And we had three wonderful speakers lined up, Sarah Brooks, Luke Dyke, and Andrew Wozniak. Unfortunately, Sarah Brooks had to cancel at the last moment due to a family emergency, and it was so last minute, we haven't been able, we weren't able to replace her. So we don't quite have the A of our ABCs. We're gonna concentrate on the B and the C, but Luke is actually gonna be talking about bubbles and their effects on aerosols. So we're sort of sneaking that A in anyway. So in particular, Luke Dykey will talk first on bubbles with a little bit of aerosols, and then Andrew Wozniak will talk on the composition of the sea surface microlayer. After each talk, we'll have about five to 10 minutes where we can ask, you can ask the questions to the speaker directly on their talk. And then after both talks, we'll have an open discussion. I'm really excited to see so many of you here where we can all talk about different priorities, directions, questions, a sort of much broader discussion on the sea surface microlayer. So now let me just introduce Luke. Luke is an assistant professor at Princeton University. He studies fluid dynamics, bubbles, and the transfer across the sea surface interface among a host of other topics. He got his PhD at the University in Paris Diderot. He's a postdoc at Scripps. And now since 2017, he has been a professor at Princeton University. So Luke, welcome to the seminar series and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks a lot, thanks a lot, uh, Rachel, for, for the introduction and for the invitation. So um, I'm gonna share screen and I hope it works again. All right, you can see everything fine? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, all right, so I'll be talking about um, ocean spray aerosol generation uh, from uh, bubbles. Uh, and in that sense, I'm gonna try to, to uh, present a way to connect uh, the, the composition of the ocean to the composition of the aerosols. And I'm not gonna quite do that, but I think what I am hoping is that I'll present a framework that can really be useful uh, uh, in, in that regard. So what I'll focus today uh, is sort of summarized in this picture, which is uh, if you are at sufficiently high wind speed, you're gonna get breaking waves in the open ocean. 
these breaking waves are going to entrain bubbles. These bubbles are going to uh, spend some time at the surface. Uh, they are going to come back and then they are going to pop. And uh, when they are bursting, they are going to uh, uh, produce drops that are going to go in the atmosphere and be transported in the atmosphere. Um, and, and they can evaporate and, and leave particles. And so this, this all cycle uh, um, will connect the ocean and the atmosphere. And, uh, and then the exact composition of the sea surface microlayer um, will, will come into play. So, the, so I'll focus about uh, some of the physics uh, of that, and I'll try to uh, show that there are, these are extremely complex processes, but there are many things we understand, uh, uh, and that we can really move forward from a modeling point of view. Um, all right. So uh, the work has been done uh, since I started in Princeton uh, about five, uh, six years ago now, uh, and it's been supported by uh, various uh, NSF and NOAA. Uh, grants as well as uh, internal funding from from Princeton University. All right, and I'll I'll cite the name of the students and postdoc as I go along. So a little bit of motivation, uh, even if I think that for this audience, I don't need to say too much about this. Um, as so uh, again, right uh, at fairly high wind speed, uh, waves are breaking and training bubbles, ejecting spray, and so it's it's going to transfer mass from the ocean to the atmosphere. If you think about um, uh, gas exchange, uh, you can think about carbon uptake, you can think about oxygen exchange that's going to be modulated by the bubbles. Um, and if you think about uh, uh, mass being exchanged from the water to the air, then you're going to have transfer of uh, momentum, heat, and moisture, uh, and the production of aerosols, which is really going to be the, the topic of today. And, and this has a very large impact on, on, um, on atmospheric processes as, as uh, the droplets dry. Uh, they leave sea salt, they leave biological particles that can serve as cloud condensation nuclei that can affect the radiative balance. Uh, so this it's it's really an important uh, component of these air sea processes. And it's to me one of the fascinating feature of this problem is that um, we're talking about uh, processes that are very small scale, uh, from micron to millimeter. When we think about the the, the drops and bubbles and that are really gonna have an impact on large scale atmospheric processes. Um, and, and, and so that really calls for, uh, for thinking about like all of the scales involved in the processes and how we can simplify uh, the picture if we want to model them properly. Um, I would like to, to so, so all of these have, oh, everything that I just said has sort of been known for a while uh, and, and, uh, and people have been working uh, on this for a while, but, um, there is still like a large need to quantify the mechanism uh, uh, responsible for ocean spray aerosol emissions. And I'm going to cite three reasons for that. The first one is just the sort of the raw uh, prediction of uh, the emissions. So this is a plot uh, of the production flux. So the number of drops produced per unit area of ocean per unit time at the ocean surface. Um, and uh, in the x-axis, you have the size of the, of the, of the, of the aerosols of the drop at 80% humidity. And, and it goes from uh, um, uh, around 10 nanometer to 10 micron and the curve could go uh, uh, beyond. And what you see on these plots is that every line is a parameterization from a certain paper, uh, either coming from field data or for lab data. And the point is that you have very large scatter uh, in these data. So you have very large uncertainties on the magnitude and shape of the sea spray aerosol production function. And, and wind speed is not going to be doing uh, uh, the job of parameterization this alone. Um, if you integrate the sea salt budget, you have uncertainty about a factor 50 in the mass of sea salt uh, being emitted, depending on which model you're going to take or, or which parameterization you're going to take. So it's really a, a large number uh, uh, in terms of like purely how many aerosols are being produced by the ocean. So that's one reason to keep working on this. Uh, the other reason, uh, which to me is a bit fascinating, is this plot that's uh, uh, from a, a GRL from Forest Area in 2018, which summarizes a, a set of studies on the role of temperature in the production of uh, sea spray. So you have a normalization, normalized concentration as a function of temperature, again, for different lab experimental field data. Uh, and, um, and what you see is that uh, some uh, data set or some parameterization are going to predict an increase in the, the number of uh, uh, 
sea salt aerosols as a function of temperature uh, that can be up to an order of magnitude uh, when you go from zero to 30 degree. And other data set or, or other parameterization are gonna give you the opposite trend. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty big deal in the sense that if you run a climate model for uh, hundreds of years, uh, and if you increase the, the production of aerosols with temperature, or if you decrease it, you're gonna get different uh, results uh, at the end of your uh, integration time. So that's that's very and that that is really tied to to a lack of of quantification or understanding of the precise role of temperature on the production mechanism. Uh, okay, and then the third topic, which is really sort of uh, two days motivation and topic, is the composition of the aerosols. Right. Um, so uh, as we will hear more in the second talk, the 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 ocean layer uh, can be full of organics. Uh, and so depending on the processes that are going to eject aerosols, um, depending if the aerosols are coming from the, the cap uh, that's between the bubble and the air, or if the aerosols are coming from the jet, their composition can be quite different. Uh, and the enrichment, so how many more organics you have, how many more uh, particles you have in the drop compared to the concentration that was in the uh, micro layer, uh, is going to depend on the mechanism. And so knowing uh, not only the size distribution, the final one, but knowing the details of what each process is doing um, uh, uh, would be important if we start to uh, be interested at uh, how different types of uh, uh, um, composition uh, come into play at the end. All right, so uh, I hope this uh, makes sense and uh, motivates for the rest of the talk. And so what I'm gonna do now is try to uh, quantify uh, these emissions of uh, aerosols by bubble bursting. And I'm going to do this by uh, breaking down the problem into uh, three sets of scales. So um, if we look at the large scale uh, sinking of a patch of ocean uh, of maybe a kilometer or something, uh, you will be able to characterize this by some mean wind speed and some sea state. So how many, uh, like what is the significant wave height and so on. And, uh, and from that, um, we can quantify the a breaking distribution, which is gonna tell you how many breaking waves you have uh, um, in that patch of ocean for a given wind speed and a given sea state. And so that's how I'm gonna characterize my large scale. Um, and, and this is, if you are used to like uh, things, like the white cap method, right? That's gonna be pretty similar to this, which is like, you're gonna characterize the large scale uh, uh, surface by something like the white cap coverage, uh, but that's going to be dynamic and that's going to be this uh, length of breaking crest distribution. Then I'm going to zoom in into the single breaking wave uh, physics. And here the question is going to be, um, how is the wave breaking? How many bubbles are being entrained and what are their sizes? And so um, this process can be studied in the lab or uh, using um, numerical simulations. And that's what I'm going to show. Uh, and from that, you can you can propose uh, model versions of your breaking waves and then eventually integrate their results uh, with the statistics of the breaking wave. Once I know how many bubbles I have and what are their sizes, I'm going to zoom into the individual bubble processes. Uh, and so I have like here three snippets from, from this uh, uh, review sketch. I'm not going to look at the bottom one, which is the gas exchange. I'm going to focus on C and D, uh, which is the production of droplets uh, from um from the the from bubble bursting and if you zoom into a single bubble that burst or even a correction of bubble that burst then again you're going to be able to like uh, uh, describe that uh, in detail and and then propose model and then you can recombine everything i'm talking about uh, and plug this into a, a global model so that's what i'm going to do uh, in the next 20 minutes or so Okay, so let's start by the intermediate scale. So the breaking wave, because that's gonna be uh, sort of the building block. Um, so what I'm gonna do uh, sort of builds on, on lab work uh, from various peoples uh, in, in the last 30 or 40 years that have characterized the scales of breaking wave. And uh, so this, these are pictures from um, a wave tank experiment where you create a focusing uh, packet, uh, the wave breaks uh, in the middle of the tank and you get this very nice bubble plume uh, that's being entrained uh, that you and, and you can you you can characterize this. 
And what uh, various people have found through these experiments is that the order one physics of breaking wave is, can be described by the speed of the breaker. Uh, so, so the speed of the crest at the moment where the wave breaks and the slope of the breaker. So the, the ratio of the amplitude over the wavelengths. And with these two pieces of information, there are lots of things that you will be able to say uh, if you are interested in, in, in the order one quantities. Um, so with that in mind, we, we developed uh, numerical simulations of these breaking waves. Uh, these are simulations that were done by Voter Mustard when he was a postdoc at Princeton. Voter is now a faculty at Oxford. Uh, and what you see here in, in this compact wave train is um, the, the jet forming, uh, uh, plunging on the surface, uh, and producing drops and bubbles. And uh, in the bottom view here, uh, you're going to see a tube of air being entrained. Uh, and then this tube of air collapsing uh, and individual bubbles being formed. And if you have access to these simulations, then you can compute the bubble size distribution. And you can do that for various conditions. Um, and you can compare to uh, available laboratory data. And so this plot uh, sort of summarizes what we know on, on the bubble size distribution and the breaking wave. Um, so here you have the the size distribution on the y-axis that's normalized in a complicated way uh, that, that relates to the geometry of the breaker and the energetic of the breaker. But basically, it's all controlled by the speed and the slope of the breaker. And then the uh, x-axis is the, the bubble size normalized by a critical length scale uh, that's called the Hinze scale, the Hinze, um, which balances turbulence and surface tension forces. And so the simple idea behind that is that if the bubble is larger than the Hinze scale, so, uh, turbulence will be able to deform it and break it. If the bubble is smaller than the Hinze scale, then it's basically stable in the turbulent flow. Um, if you want to sink into a term of physical scales, the Hinze scale is about a millimeter under a breaking wave, more or less. Uh, and the largest bubbles that are going to be observed are about 10 millimeter. Uh, and on this plot, it, the smallest ones are going to be 100 microns. You can definitely really have smaller ones, but uh, this just corresponds to the, the precision of the, I mean, the resolution of the simulation or experiment that are plotted here. Um, what you see on this plot is that more or less all the data fall onto uh, each other, and you have two uh, regimes. Uh, the first regime for the large bubbles uh, is uh, described by a certain power law, which is minus 10 over 3. And this can be explained by a very nice uh, turbulence model that was proposed by Chris Garrett uh, a bit more than 20 years ago now. Uh, so this works really well. Uh, it, it makes a bunch of turbulence assumption and, and it describes these large bubbles and this cascade of large bubble. The smaller one, uh, uh, the explanation for the other regime has been a little bit more elusive. Uh, and we recently spent a lot of time uh, uh, understanding and showing that this really comes from uh, a capillary driven breakup process. So I'm going to skip the sort of details, um, but the point is that we can explain and understand this uh, a shallow uh, small bubble scope, and we also understand the larger bubble. And so we have this universal description of the bubble size distribution and the breaking wave. Uh, and if you want the details of uh, the theoretical explanation, I'm happy to uh, dive into this, um, uh, or you have all the references from the, the really nice work that uh, Agino has been reading on this. Um, the takeaway point of these five minutes on breaking waves is that uh, we like a breaking wave and trains bubbles, and the size, this, the amount of air that's being entrained and the size of the bubble that are being entrained is at this point fairly well understood. Like I'm not saying it's uh, it's it's everything is exact, but the order one uh, uh, size distribution is 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 at this point fairly well understood. So we know uh, uh, how many bubbles we have more or less, and we know uh, their sizes. And now we can go into the individual uh, uh, bubble processes, like what is gonna each of these bubbles gonna do when they reach the surface? Um, so uh, we, we designed an experiment uh, in Princeton, and that's work that was initially started by Baptiste Nair and then continued by uh, Megan Mazatenta and Martin. Um, and, um, the, um, the idea was to do an experiment where we inject bubbles of sizes that we control, and then we track them underwater, and then we track them at the surface, and then we track the drops and the particles that are being emitted. 
And so here, uh, if you have good eyes, you can see on the movie that you have the bubbles and the water, the bubbles at the surface, and you see little streaks uh, of drops coming up. Uh, so again, the point of this experiment is uh, we're going to look at the bulk, the surface, uh, and the drops. And uh, because it's in the lab and it's a fairly small scale experiment, we're going to be able to play with the size distribution in the bulk and 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 and, and look at the resulting uh, behavior at the surface and the resulting uh, droplet size distribution. So um, we we can mimic the size distribution of uh, bubbles uh, underwater and at the surface uh, to be the one to be one that's quite similar to uh, the the. Um, the one under breaking wave. So you get the breaking wave analog uh, um, and, uh, and you have this size distribution that, that follows this, these two regimes that have been talking about. And, and then you get these very nice pictures at the surface um, that we hope are somehow representative at, at, of a foam at the ocean surface. Uh, we can argue about that at the end, uh, uh, but that's sorts of the hypothesis here. And then we go into the air and we measure the drops and particles that are uh, produced. And so here in this uh, experiment, it's um, this experiment is done with salt water. Um, and the, so everything that's above about 10 micron here is measured with uh, optical techniques uh, where you, you see the droplets when they are flying in the air. So you're really directly measuring the drop size. Uh, so we're using an holography and a shadowgraphy technique but it's basically direct measurements of the drop, and we, we can see them. Um, when in the range, like from a little bit below one micron to 10 micron in, in, in like wet droplet size, uh, we use something that's called, that's an OPS. Uh, so it, it's an it's a optical base system, but you're extracting the droplet, you're drying it, and you're measuring uh, the size of the particle uh, based on me scattering. And then you, we have the SMPS, which is based on scanning mobility uh, that measures uh, things from about 100 nanometer to a micron. And so the, 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 the small scale, are, are we're measuring the solid particles and then uh, uh, tracking back what droplet it would have correspond to. Uh, here it's all sea salt, right? Uh, we're using uh, artificial seawater and the, the particle, uh, we're sort of expecting that it's all uh, sea salt. And so what I want to do with this is um, connect this size distribution to individual mechanism with, again, the idea uh, to, to then uh, uh, be able to predict, if I know the bubbles, being able to predict uh, the droplets. So if you go back in the literature uh, about emissions of uh, droplets by bubble bursting, you're going to find two words. Uh, you're going to see uh, people talking about film drops and jet drops. And film drops uh, can be visualized through this sorts of pictures where uh, you have, so this is a sort of a 10 millimeter bubble sitting at the free surface. You get this very big cap. And at some point this cap, cap is gonna rupture and the film is gonna retract. And as it retracts, it's gonna eject uh, droplets. And so material that was in the film can then be ejected in the air. Uh, this process is mostly efficient for bubbles that are gonna be around the millimeter and larger. Um, and, um, and the dynamic is, 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 uh, uh, can be described by various processes, uh, but it's all gonna be a question of how big was the bubble compared to the capillary length. Uh, the other emission process um, is what's called jet drops. In that case, um, so once the film has ruptured, you're left with a cavity underwater and that cavity uh, is unstable and is going to collapse and emit a uh, jet uh, that's going to uh, leave a, a bunch of drops in the air. Uh, this process is going to work for bubbles mostly smaller than the millimeter, and it's going to work fine in water down to 10 micron. Below 10 micron, viscosity is going to viscous viscous dissipation is going to become too important, and so it's going to produce uh, drops of uh, 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 sizes that are going to be about a tenth of the, the initial bubble. I'll go into that in detail. Um, and the point is that like lab experiment, like what I want to do now is like, how can, I, can we push the understanding of individual uh, bursting process uh, uh, to understand our corrective behavior? Okay, so this is a simulation of a single bubble 
uh, bursting, like a single, uh, uh, this is going to be a single jet. So you start with the cavity, um, the cavity collapse. It's about a millimeter uh, uh, in radius for the bubble here. You see these beautiful capillary wave focus to the center of the cavity, and then the jet forms and rises up. Uh, the colors are the vorticity, and then the, the, the jet is going to detach and form a small number of droplets. And so again, if you want to think in terms of scale, like the bubble was maybe two millimeter, and so the droplet here is going to be maybe 100 to 200 micron for the large one, uh, and half of that for the, the smaller one. Um, so again, once you have these simulations, you can vary the parameter as much as you want uh, and explore um, the size of the, the drop, the velocity of the drop uh, when you're changing uh, your controlling parameter. Um, from what we have done and from the literature, uh, it's been demonstrated that the dynamic is controlled by the ratio of the bubble size to uh, what's called the viscocapillary length, L mu, which is, uh, which is defined by the viscosity and surface tension uh, uh, of, the, of the liquid. Uh, and so if you look at large bubbles, so large uh, ratio of the bubble size over the viscocapillary length, you get the red profiles uh, when you're producing the drops. So a fairly large drop compared to the overall geometry. Uh, and if you go to smaller bubbles, uh, so say about 10 micron in water, you get the blue profile. And here you can see that uh, you have a very small uh, uh, droplet compared to the bubble size. Um, you can put all the data that exists in the literature into a single plot. If you plot the size of the drop as a function of the size of the bubble, normalized by this viscocapillary length, um, you have uh, all the data on all of this range that goes from thousands to a few hundred thousand in terms of this ratio. So again, thousand is about 10 micron in water, and this is gonna be like uh, about three millimeter in water. But all of these points of various colors uh, correspond to different liquids. So some of these measurements were done in um, fresh water, some of these measurements were done in salt water, some of them in ethanol and glycerol and whatever you can think of. Um, and, and so it's, it's really like a, a general behavior of, uh, and a general curve for the size of the drop as a function of the size of the bubble. Uh, and you can, uh, you can look up this paper and you have a very nice uh, theoretical uh, explanation for the black curve that describe your size. The point, what I'm hoping I've convinced you here, is that uh, through these individual uh, process studies, we can predict the size of the drop. We could also predict their velocity and the number of uh, drops produced by a single bubble bursting. You can do this then, um, you can acquire statistics so that you also get uh, the size distribution associated to single event. And at this point, because you know what's the distribution of bubble under the breaking wave from the first part of my talk, you can integrate all of your individual bubble process into all the bubbles in the system. And what we're doing here is we're assuming that uh, all the bubbles are going to behave as if they were alone, which is a big assumption. And then you just sum everything in a sense. And so you're going to end up uh, with this. You're going to write this mathematically as this integral. Um, you integrate over the bubble size distribution and it's multiplied by a, by a factor that's going to describe the droplet being produced. And so you would do this for the jet drop processes that I just described, and you could do exactly the same work for the film drop, uh, uh, which, which like other people had done. And so I'm also going to use uh, that work in the coming slides. So now I can come back to my experimental data uh, where I have my droplet distribution as a function of droplet size going from 100 nanometer to a few hundred microns. And I can plug in uh, my theoretical relationship based on the individual processes. So if I look at jet drops, um, I get this dotted lines here. And so what I'm getting is that jet drop can mostly describe uh, uh, drops from two micron onwards, uh, and you get a shape that's uh, quite uh, good. Um, so that's nice. And so if you want to go to smaller sizes, then you need to look at the uh, relationship that have been proposed in the literature for film drops. And so you can, reasonably well capture this peak around a few, around 100 to 200 nanometer. Um, and then maybe you can capture a part of these intermediate scales. And so the point is that 
uh, again, it's 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 of course not a one-to-one -one relationship, uh, and we can discuss the details. Um, but but it's pretty reasonable in the sense that uh, you're doing this without fitting parameter, and and you're you're getting the right shape, and you're getting the right numbers of droplets through these uh, assumption and individual mechanism. Okay. So um, now that I have looked at this uh, microphysics, uh, I need to integrate this um, uh, over larger scale uh, to be able to look at um, the ocean. And so this is going to be done theoretically uh, using the framework developed by Phillips on the length of breaking crests. And so I'm going to be quick on the detail. But again, the idea is to do superposition of events, right? So. The total air being untrained is going to be the integral over the air being untrained from a single breaker um, and then integrated over every breaking event. Uh, and so for that, then you, that means you need to characterize your breaking wave distribution. Uh, and so this is done uh, through this um, length of breaking crest framework. So this, this is a movie from uh, Ken Melville's group uh, with uh, uh, so an aircraft flying over the ocean and you see that breaking patch that moves in the opposite direction of the aircraft. And so from these movies, uh, you can extract the length of the breaker and its speed. And if you do that, um, because air entrainment is characterized by the breaker speed and the breaker height, uh, you can uh, 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 combine everything that I've been talking about and estimate the total amount of droplet being produced. And so that's what's going to come through this integral that looks complicated, but again, it's really just superposition of a bunch of processes. Uh, so you are integrating over all of your breaking events. That's my green box. You're integrating over all the bubbles created by each breaking event, and that's my red box. And then you're uh, 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 applying these uh, scaling functions in terms of the production of droplets. And again, you do this for both jet and film drop. And so if you can model waves, which uh, we can do using uh, various tools, uh, then you can use the other relationship to 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 uh, um, to predict aerosol production, and so this uh, leads to this final curve in terms of modeling. And then I have a few more discussion points. Um, this is from this is uh, the 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 sea spray emission function from the beginning, uh, but now with our model, which is like the 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 red and blue line uh, for a particular storm event. Um, that shows that our model captures some sea state variability. But the most important point here is that it compares reasonably well with uh, uh, some of the other dashed and dotted lines uh, that uh, are where are from the literature, that are various parameterization from the literature. And so the, the overall framework sort of gives the right order of magnitude shape that are comparable uh, for these uh, uh, C spray aerosol uh, data. And so it's, it's, uh, it's I mean, so from there, we, we are going to move forward and, and then use it globally. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, we're going to use it globally uh, by um, leveraging a global wave model. So this is work done with, uh, with Brendan Riker and Fabian Poro at, uh, at uh, NOAA GFDL. Um, so the general idea, right? You have wind speed products that are going to be used for, uh, to force the model. You have a wave model, so you can uh, pre predict wave height and the local sea state and breaking distribution. And so you can get air entrainment uh, and sea spray air also. And so um, uh, I think I, I have to, to, to wrap up, right, Rachel? Uh, so, so this allows to do uh, maps such as this one where you have emissions of sea salt uh, and then analyze it uh, compared to, to, to previous uh, work and previous data set and discuss uh, um, how our predictions uh, uh, would align or not align with, with what is currently being used in various models. And I want to finish on a note that uh, connects to uh, the surface microlayer and the question of enrichment of these droplets, because like all of this is basically looking at sea salt. So you're assuming that your drop evaporates and leave whatever salt was uh, uh, in there. And you don't take into account uh, uh, the possible enrichment by, by organics that would have to be added. Uh, and that's something we're thinking about. But because we have that sort of coherent framework where every, every scale is described uh, uh, in a physical way, and then is, all the scales are glued together to quantify the, the, the exchange, it's actually easy to adapt, right? 
uh, if you tell me that film drops are enriched in a particular organic in a certain way, then we can plug this into uh, uh, all of the equations and we're gonna immediately come up with a, with a global prediction of that particular uh, uh, transfer. And we have been applying this idea uh, for microplastic emissions. So that's a very recent work that's just got submitted by uh, Dan Shaw, one of the students in my group. Uh, and so we did experiments where we had microplastic in the water, and then we tracked down how many particles you have that are being ejected in the drop. And so it gets to this sort of plot where you have the number of microplastic particles as a function uh, of the uh, basically the number of particles that was in the bulk of the water. Uh, uh, and, and you get a relationship. And so you can extract an enrichment factor in the same way that you would do it for uh, organic material. And so then uh, we can like basically combine this with microplastic maps uh, to, to, to look at emissions. And, and I think it's something that's quite exciting uh, uh, when we think about uh, predicting uh, emissions of, of various types of uh, material. So I'll go back to my uh, summary slide and I'm happy to take questions. And I hope I wasn't too long. That was wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. No. Okay, my screen is frozen. Thank you so much, Luke. Do people have questions? We can have a few questions for Luke. Luke, do you wanna just call on people? Um, sure, Lisa? Um, I think David might have raised his hand first, but I'll try to be quick. Um, yeah, you're, I was struck by your, your um, statement that to include organics in this, now that you've got the physical framework set up, it's just straightforward to um, in, incorporate the enrichment factor. But I'm wondering if it might not actually be more complicated than, than you might have, have presented because um, with dissolved organic matter, um, it could really change the nature of the bubble bursting and the distribution. Yeah. Do you, you right. want to yeah. say something about that? Yes, I'll be very happy to say something about that. That's an excellent question. So uh, I'm going to go back to my... So um, that's why microplastic was a good first example, because uh, uh, so microplastic was a great first example of what I said for two reasons. The first one is that if the particle is large enough to be larger than the films, then it can't be transported by film drops. So it's really only the jet drop process that matters. And so then everything is sort of easy, right? Material gets collected and transmitted into the drop and everything is fine. Um, your question is excellent because you, you, what you're saying is that if you talk about film drop, sure, you're gonna have enrichment, but the, the presence of the uh, uh, surface active material is gonna do more than just being transported, it's going to change the physics of the bursting. And so that's going to be true for the, uh, the film drop processes. And so uh, what we're going to have to do is to do these studies into the individual processes for film drop. And then it's these new, these new uh, relationships that are going to come into the framework. And so my point is that I think we can keep everything else. But yes, the, the scaling relationships for the film drops might be different uh, and they might be different for different types of material and organics. And that is very much not clear. But I think if we get this from the lab, then sort of seeing like, then finding numbers globally could, could then this framework could be used. I hope I'm answering your question and it's not too disappointing as an answer. Uh, David. Hi, Luke. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask almost exactly the same uh, <laughs> question as Lisa, but I'll modify it slightly. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you've explained about the film gold production and perhaps there's a sensitivity to the organic material there. I was wondering about the production of the small bubbles. Did, could you talk about capillary processes and the filament breaking up? Yes. Do you think at that stage also there may be a sensitivity to organic material sometimes? Okay, that's possible, but I think 
we don't need to worry about it too much. Um, so I'll answer in two ways. Um, so when we look at this size distribution here from the lab, uh, it goes down to maybe 20 micron, 10 to 20 micron. Our resolution is actually much better than this. So it's it's we think it's a real peak, that there is nothing at the surface that is smaller than 10 to 20 micron. Um, and I don't think it's because they are not formed, the bubbles. I think it's because they never make it to the surface because the flow is turbulent. And so I think um, there is probably a cutoff about which bubbles make it to the surface. Uh, and I think it, it, it has to be in a sense because when we do gas transfer models, we are thinking that some of the smallest bubbles fully dissolve. So if they fully dissolve for gas exchange, they can't come at the surface to produce drops. Um, and uh, uh, so that's why I think uh, the, the, there is a cutoff from 10 to 50 micron, maybe it's a little larger, it's not completely clear. Uh, and which means we might not need to really worry about the production of the smallest bubbles in terms of aerosol production. I think we have to worry about it in terms of gas exchange, but maybe not for aerosol production. Is that where you were going or not? That makes perfect sense to me, Luke. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I would point out that occasionally the surface water could be quite highly supersaturated. So maybe circumstances where even a very small bubble will make it to the surface because it will actually be growing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good point. Yeah. In the chat, there were a few questions. One of them about organics, I think you've addressed to some extent, but there were also some questions about how either salinity or bubble coalescence, I know those are two separate yeah. things, but just combining the questions, how do those influence, those two ideas influence your results? Right, um, okay, so salinity, um, okay, let's start with coalescence. Uh, if the flow is turbulent, if the flow is turbulent and the water is not clean, which are two things that are always there in the ocean, uh, you, it's almost impossible to coalesce bubbles. I mean, it's, it might happen once in a while, but it's statistically insignificant uh, because you need the bubbles to meet, which doesn't happen that very often, and you need them to stay in contact long enough to coalesce. So I, I'm pretty confident that we don't need to worry about coalescence in the bulk. At the surface, you will have coalescence, and so your surface distribution is going to be slightly different from the bulk distribution. Everything we have done seems to indicate that it's not a huge change. Um, and then salinity, um, salinity doesn't change too much the production process of the bubbles and the water for everything that's above 50 or 100 micron. Maybe again, the small stuff, uh, there are some evidence that the smaller ones might be affected, but we don't see anything dramatic. Um, and the production of aerosols, um, it might, we, at this point, we haven't seen huge effects on, uh, on the, on the, either the film drop production or the jet drop production. Uh, I don't want to say that there is nothing because I don't think that's necessarily true, but we haven't seen huge effects. I hope I answered the question. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Luke, for your talk. And now let's move on. We will have a discussion at the end, so we can always touch back on some of these themes or go into new ones. So our second speaker is Andrew Wozniak, who's an assistant professor at the University of Delaware, who uses tools from marine organic chemistry, geochemistry, to look into the composition, the chemical composition of the microlayer. And Andrew got his PhD at VIMS, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, did a postdoc at Old Dominion, and has been a professor at the University of Delaware since 2017. So Andrew, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Hopefully this will be uh, an exciting talk, but exciting for very different reasons. Um, so uh, as Rachel mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about untargeted high resolution mass spectrometry for characterizing organics in the sea surface microlayer. Most of what I'm talking about is going to be taken from uh, work from my master's student, Nicole Coffey, who has moved on to get her PhD at Oregon State University. So she'll be on the 
postdoc market sometime in the near future. My other collaborators are <clears throat> Amy McKenna from the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory at Florida State University and Alina Ebling from the University of Delaware. So I, I, what I'm showing here is a beautiful cartoon of the microlayer taken from Whirl et al. in 2017, who does a very nice job of showing the links between bio biological processes and the, this upper mixed layer and then um, the microlayer itself. And in particular, the contribution of these lipid molecules uh, that accumulate at the sea surface microlayer. So we know that the microlayer is enriched in a lot of biological marker compounds, uh, including organic surfactants. And these organic surfactants include some of these lipid compounds, but they also are going to include a, a, a wide variety of organic matter that aren't going to fit into our biochemical classes of compounds. This is, uh, uh, for those of you who are, are familiar with, you know, organic chemistry uh, cartoons of compounds, this is what an amphiphilic surfactant molecule will look like. This polar end group is going to be more aligned to the water with the um, nonpolar end being aligned to the atmosphere. This makes these compounds also um, attracted to bubbles with the uh, nonpolar end being attracted to the interior of the bubble and the polar group to the water. And so this might remind you of from a biology class where you had um, conversations about phospholipids in a cell membrane, for example. Why are these compounds important? Well, they, they impart certain physical properties to the microlayer. In, with, in particular, they decrease the surface tension and turbulence at the microlayer surface. And this has important implications for air-sea exchanges, both in terms of gas exchange and the production of marine aerosols, as well as um, for aerosol deposition and um, incorporation of, of atmospherically deposited material. So here's another great cartoon from Wilson et al. Uh, I like this one because it's showing the bubbles and how these organics are being scavenged onto a bubble to accumulate then in this green microlayer area. With the wave breaking um, process, you get the emission of primary marine aerosols into the atmosphere that are enriched in these organics, which I've told you have, are enriched in those surfactants. And Amanda Frossard et al. in 2019 published a paper that measured uh, the, the enrichment of those surfactant compounds. So this is their enrichment factor. They measured the concentration of the surfactants shown here in the seawater and then again in the aerosols that are emitted from their bubble bursting aerosol generator. And they did that for highly productive regions in the North Atlantic. Those are in the green and in oligotrophic areas of the Sargasso Sea. And so you can see that these enrichments are on the order of 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth um, higher concentrations on the, in the aerosols than you would have expected based on the concentration, their concentration in seawater. So they're selectively transferred via that, via that bubble bursting process into the atmosphere with some important implications uh, for atmospheric processes uh, that some of you in the audience and, and our next speaker can probably talk about way better than I can. Uh, another really neat thing that Amanda's group did here is they measured uh, a property of the surfactants called the critical micelle concentration. And the critical micelle concentration is a nice property because it gives us an idea of the the quality or the, the strength of the surfactants that are present. Essentially, a the concentration, the, the CMC is the concentration at which surfactants can form a, a micelle. And so a lower concentration, like we see here in the highly productive station four, uh, is indicative of actually higher surfactant strengths compared to what we see in the, the Sargasso Sea. So in the Sargasso Sea, we're seeing um, a, a difference in the quality or the strength of the surfactants that has a lower surfactant strength. And importantly, where we see these low CMCs is where we see a, a high, the highest enrichment factor in their experiments. 
So this tells us uh, that composition matters, that the composition of these surfactants are, are important in addition to the concentration. So what's controlling the surfactant strength? Well, it's most likely compound properties, things like the length of the chain uh, on that uh, amphiphilic compound, perhaps uh, the identity of that head group, and maybe the ionicity of that compound. So again, we're going to argue here that the composition matters, and we, we, we ought to try and do our best to understand how these compounds are going to produce these surfactant uh, properties. So now this is a, a less beautiful cartoon, and that's because I made it, uh, showing gas exchange at the sea surface. And, and it, it really is just intended to show you that we are, we're also exchanging gases at the sea surface. We do have our green microlayer. I stayed with the blue-green theme. Uh, and, and we have lots of biologically relevant and atmospherically relevant gases that are going back and forth uh, between the atmosphere and the ocean. And uh, once again, what I'm showing here is uh, some data from Goldman et al, 1988, and they are not the only paper that are, are showing an influence of surfactants on the mass transfer velocity of these gases across the air-sea interface. As you increase uh, the concentration of these surfactants, and here they use polyethylene oxide and oleal alcohol, you can see that that mass transfer velocity declines. Um, and so the presence of surfactants is going to influence the velocity and, and the, the rate of exchange of these gases across the, the sea surface interface. What their data also show is a difference in the response of the microlayer or, the, or rather the oxygen mass uh, velocity rate for different surfactants. So you see here, the dashed lines here show the amount of uh, reduction or the percentage reduction. And you can see oleal alcohol uh, reduces the, the mass transfer, the gas transfer velocity more than the polyethylene oxide. So again, uh, it's, we're getting a compound specific response in, in these gas transfer velocities and the composition of that surfactant matters. So um, there are many questions, uh, key questions for surfactant biogeochemistry in the microlayer. And my group has identified two that, that we're very interested in. And one is the, the uh, what are the identity of these key surfactant compounds in the microlayer? Are they classes of compounds, specific compounds, and, and so forth? And what are the biogeochemical and oceanographic factors that influence surfactant spatiotemporal variations? Now, we know uh, from great work uh, by many groups, including uh, this paper by Sabagadza et al., that we do get um, variations in surfactant activity. So they, Sabagadza et al., uh, conducted two uh, cruises in the Atlantic, uh, marked by the blue and the red dots here. Uh, and they analyzed surfactant activity in the microlayer on the top and the subsurface water on the bottom. And you can see that there's certainly variations latitudinally with a lot of surfactant activity in the northern polar regions. And we also see variations uh, between the two cruises uh, that suggest um, spatiotemporal variations that require um, investigation. Now, we know that there are, are several factors that are, go are going to influence surfactant activity. We know temperature, biogeography, and, and biology in the form of chlorophyll A measurements, amino acids, fatty acid, or carbohydrates, primary productivity measurements. We all see that these things influence surfactant activity. Um, but the results vary in terms of how well any of these properties are going to influence surfactant activity. And again, my argument is that's because we need to know a little bit more about the chemistry of the compounds in the microlayer. Uh, and I'm going to argue to you that we we, we ought to adapt uh, adopt some untargeted approaches to our toolkit uh, for a characterizing organic matter and relating it to surface activity. And and some of the key information that we get from that or that leads me to that conclusion it comes from Amon and Benner. This is a paper um, that summarizes some. Uh, some of the really good work on organic matter composition in the ocean 
they characterized the amount of organic carbon that can be characterized as amino and neutral sugars or amino acids uh, into these various uh, compound class pools. And we can see if we look at the surface ocean, particulate matter is fairly well explained, but still only characterizing about 30% of the organic carbon. Now, importantly, particulate organics are, a, are an order of magnitude lower in concentration than the dissolved organics, which are represent, represented uh, around 12% and less than 5% in the high molecular weight and low molecular weight DOM as biochemicals. So that tells you that there's a whole lot of, of organic matter that's going uncharacterized. And you can see that the variation in the amount of car carbon that's being, um, that's represented by the size classes varies uh, inversely. So the small groups of, of organic matter represent a lot of that organic carbon. So we need to understand the composition of these tens to thousands of organic compounds uh, that have a range of potential surfer surfactant properties to better understand surfactant activity. And that's where I'm, I'm going to suggest that these untargeted approaches get added to our toolkit. I'm not, I'm not arguing that we should stop looking at these biochemicals. I think they're giving us fantastic information, but some of these untargeted approaches can, we can learn a lot from. So our approach was to look at um, the variability of organic matter properties and surface tension properties for samples collected in Delaware Bay region. So we have four samples here. They cover a range of salinities, uh, depending on tide, of course, uh, and time of year. Uh, we sampled them on four different, uh, four to five different occasions, depending on the site, uh, representing different seasons, summer, fall, winter and spring, and we've characterized them as marine, mid-bay, and then the respective rivers where we sampled them. We analyzed them for dissolved organic carbon quantities, uh, surface tension using pendant drop tensiometry, fluorescent DOM characteristics, which I'm not sure that I'll have the time to, to discuss today, uh, but if we do, I can add that at the end of the talk. And then Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry, uh, which is a technique uh, that's commonly used in the marine dissolved organic matter community. So when we look at our data, I've, I've got our data plotted here on the x-axis by sampling date, and I'm, I'm on the y-axis showing the enrichment factor in the dissolved organic carbon, which is represented as the concentration in the microlayer divided by that in the subsurface water. So a concentration above one or, or a, a, an enrichment factor above one is showing us we're enriched in dissolved organic matter or dissolved organic carbon. And we see that for the majority of the samples. Uh, we also measured surface tension depressions. And here I, I'm characterizing surface de tension depression as the difference between the surface tensor, tension in a subsurface sample and that of the microlayer sample. So a value above zero is a depression by this definition. And again, we see the majority of our samples do show those surface tension depressions. Uh, and we don't have a, a, a sufficient data to look for temporal trends perhaps, uh, although perhaps maybe the indication that we do see higher surface tension depressions in the summertime. So we then analyzed all our data using Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry. We took our samples to the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. This is a picture of their 21 Tesla magnet. We used the 9.4 Tesla uh, for this work. It's a, a popular technique used to study dissolved organic matter, and it characterizes molecular the molecular formulas for polar ionizable solid phase extracted DOM. So it's a subset of our dissolved organic matter. Uh, that can be solid phase extracted and ionized using electrospray ionization. And the solid phase extraction step is used to eliminate the salts that are going to impact that ionization. The mass spectrum that I'm showing here uh, is from a, an early paper that I published in 2008 and shows you just all the peaks that you can get in the, the range of around, in this paper, 200 to 700 mass to charge or, or Daltons. Uh, and that's a typical range. Uh, sometimes that range can extend up to maybe a thousand Daltons. 
the value of the technique is it can be seen when you zoom in at, to a really small uh, wind, mass window. Here I'm showing 481 to 481.5, and you can see that we're getting somewhere around 20 distinguishable peaks. Um, and that's due to the high resolution of the technique. Uh, and if you have a, a really good calibration, which we do, you can then assign these molecular formulas to the ions that you detect uh, using carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur as the constituents. Some people will add phosphorus or some other elements. Uh, that's what we've used here. And the information that you get is not quantitative, and that's due to the uh, variations in ionizability of different compounds. Uh, and you do not get direct structural information, but you can infer structural information from the formulas that you get. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So um, what I'm showing here is a Van Crevelin diagram, and you're either groaning because you've seen a million of these in at DOM talks, or you're really confused because you have no idea what I'm showing you. So let me explain. And apologies to those of you who are groaning. Um, if we take these molecular formulas that we've assigned, you can calculate a hydrogen to carbon ratio uh, on the y-axis and an oxygen to carbon ratio on the x-axis for every formula uh, that, you, that is assigned. Then you can plot them on one of these diagrams and get an idea of the distribution of formulas in that Van Crevelin diagram space. And Slichter and Hatcher in 2008 uh, put these ovals on here as guides to the eye to give you an idea of the types of compounds that you have in your sample. Uh, now, you'll, you'll note that I'm calling them molecular formulas. That's because those molecular formulas could represent any number of isomeric compounds. Um, and any data that's falling in this lipid oval does not mean that I have lipid compounds. It means I have lipid-like compounds that have similar H to C and O to C ratios that fall in here. So I'm not arguing that we have all these lignin compounds. In fact, I'm pretty sure we don't uh, in a lot of my data, at least. Uh, another way to characterize that uh, is to use this framework here. And if you, you just want to, um, I'm showing this because this is the framework that I'm using for my data. Uh, you can characterize your samples, your formulas as saturated fatty acids, unsaturated aliphatics, or if it has nitrogen peptide-like compounds highly unsaturated aliphatic or polyphenolic compounds with oxygen to carbon ratios less than 0.5 or with oxygen carbon ratios higher than 0.5 or condensed aromatic carbon compounds. And we do that just simply by using those molecular formulas and the element of those elemental ratios and calculations of an aromaticity index. And that gives us not, not uh, definite structural information, but an idea of what our compounds may look like at the molecular level. Okay, so here we have some data from one of the sample sets uh, from March 2019. On the left is a data, data for the microlayer, and on the right, uh, the subsurface. You can see that we're characterizing a lot of formulas in both of these samples in all those regions that I showed you. Uh, but I've highlighted a, a, in ovals a couple of regions here uh, that are are showing some distinct differences. Um, and in particular, we're seeing contributions from formulas in the microlayer in these areas that aren't present here in the subsurface waters. So in the microlayer, we're seeing more formulas at, at these low O to C and high H to C ratios. And these would correspond to maybe lipid-like, protein-like, and unsaturated hydrocarbons. But this is one sample, and I'm not going to go through all 24 samples to show you what these things look like and then pick apart what I, what I uh, uh, think are important. Instead, what we do is we take the relative abundance of each of these molecular formulas, and I should mention that the color coding here uh, represents the elemental constituents. So the red is sulfur-containing, uh, the purple is nitrogen-containing, the light blue is just CH and, and O and the pink has nitrogen and sulfur. So we can take those relative abundances and put them in a principal component analysis and pick apart the detail, the, the differences in our sample data set. And that's what I've done here. 
and you can see uh, I've color coded my samples again. This time blue is our marine site, purple mid bay, yellow and green are our two uh, more terrestrial influence sites. Um, and the data in principal component two and principal component one uh, do separate in in somewhat logical way. On the x-axis, we're, we're separated primarily based on salinity, with our marine site having the highest salinities, and, and this being our sample that has a salinity of 11. So that's explaining quite a bit of the variation in the data, and that makes sense based on our understanding of terrestrial versus marine organic matter sources. On the y-axis, more importantly to this uh, group here, we see, do see some separation between our subsurface samples in the filled circles versus the X's, which are our microlayer samples. So I'm, I'm putting this um, uh, X, Y coordinate here for a guide here, and we can take a look at the data. Um, what we then did was took our principal component scores for all our samples and correlated them with the formula uh, uh, abundances in all our samples so that we could get um, an idea of which formulas may be um, driving these trends that we're seeing for salinity and, and subsurface and microlayer. And here are our are, are negative PC1 associated, so marine or high salinity loadings. And for those of you who know marine DOM, uh, this looks like carboxyl rich alicyclic molecules, and these look like carbohydrates or maybe ionizable carbohydrates. Here are our low salinity for formulas. Again, not as exciting for the microlayer, but, but I'm getting there, don't worry. And we can see that our hydrogen to carbon ratio was, are getting much lower, uh, and that's indicative of soil organic matter inputs. Uh, and again, this is a, a trend that we should expect on a salinity gradient. So in a way, it's, a, it's telling us that our, our PCA is doing a good job. Now, if I look at the formulas that are associated with the microlayer, a negative PC2, we can see that we have a grouping, a strong trend uh, towards high hydrogen to carbon ratio and low oxygen to carbon ratio. And in particular, we see all these red dots that are our sulfur containing formulas. And that can be contrasted with the subsurface waters, um, which are just about a foot below the, um, or an arm's length below literally the, the, the microlayer. And we can see these compounds that look a lot more like what we would see in these uh, marine and, and lower salinity uh, groupings. Um, so higher O to C compounds probably don't have those amphiphilic properties that we described previously. So now, um, uh, the other, you can characterize your data by elemental formula distribution, and I've done that here. This is for all our sample pairs, and, and I've got our microlayer sample paired right next to a subsurface sample, and in the red is your sulfur-containing formulas. This light blue is CHO, the dark blue is CHON. And I want to focus on the sulfur-containing formulas that I pointed out previously. And you can see that these, in the microlayer, the sulfur-containing formulas consistently have a higher relative abundance than the corresponding subsurface water. And this occurs for pretty much all of our samples across the board, indicating that these sulfur-containing surfactants uh, seem to be associated with microlayer. So let me take a step here to, to uh, summarize these data before I get into some relationships with surface tension. Uh, we saw that the salinity of location was our primary driver of the composition, but the microlayer and subsurface do have uh, this relationship whereby you have this trend towards the top left corner of our Van Krevelin diagram, showing contributions from high hydrogen to carbon, low oxygen to carbon uh, formulas and compounds. And these compounds are primarily unsaturated aliphatics, and we see high contributions from these sulfur-containing formulas. So when we look into the literature uh, for some of these sulfur-containing formulas, um, we find some potential sources in the form of sulfano and sulfolipids. 
So this paper uh, here from Wozniak et al., who is potentially a distant relationship, I would think. I, I don't I have no idea. Um, you, you can see some of these potential sulfonolipid compounds uh, that they isolated from algal and bacterial um, cultures. In the bottom here, we have some additional figures uh, of, of potential compounds that my student Nicole drew up as as uh, possibilities of structures that would would satisfy the molecular formulas that we're seeing in here. We have no stru firm structural information, so these are purely hypothetical. But there is a, a clear potential link then, and a potential to probable link to biological um, uh, sources. Uh, we can't necessarily rule out photochemical sources or and or photochemical and biological degradation. In fact, we probably sure that there are transformations of initial biologically produced compounds that are producing all these compounds that we're observing. So what's happening with our surface tension? Well, if you know something about surface tension, you notice there's a flaw in our design, and that's that salinity uh, is going to be a factor in surface tension. And so isolating the effects of organic matter based on our data set is going to be a little bit of a challenge. So what we decided to do was take a look at a smaller subset of our data, look concentrating on the samples but collected uh, above a salinity of 27. That encompasses our marine station and um, a couple of sampling points from the other stations. And we explored all kinds of correlations in the data. And the only really strong correlations we found were with surface tension depression and these unsaturated aliphatic formulas. So I apologize for the table format, uh, but this percentage of unsaturated aliphatic formulas uh, show correlations for the whole data set, uh, our value of 0 0.5, for the salinity controlled and for just the marine station with considerably higher R, R values of 0.83 and 0.87. And their enrichment factors were similarly correlated with, and this is with te surface tension depression. So these unsaturated aliphatic compounds are highly correlated to surface tension depression. We did look for some other correlations using our FDOM data, and we see an inverse relationship with fluorescence index and surface tension. Potentially, um, uh, fluorescence index is an indication of microbial activity, so this may indicate um, uh, a role for microbes to play in, um, in, in controlling surface tension. And then the tyrosine, tyrosine peak in FDOM also shows a correlation with the salinity control data set um, and surface tension depression. This tyrosine peak is, a, is an amino acid peak that's present in our FDOM. And if I look at the time, um, I can try to wrap up here in the next few slides. So where are these um, formulas? These formulas are showing up uh, here in this region of our Van Crevelin diagram, that region that I've already identified for you as potentially important. These are the characteristics of those molecular formulas that we're using to classify as unsaturated aliphatics. What are the candidate compounds that could lead to uh, compounds plotting in this region? Uh, things like terpenoid pigments, unsaturated lipids. So these are lipids, fatty acids, and alcohols that have uh, double bonds. And then microbial and photochemically altered derivatives of thereof, uh, thereof these kinds of compounds. Um, I'm going to skip through the FDOM uh, measurements. If anybody has questions about those data, I'd be happy to answer them uh, or or you can look for the paper, which should be resubmitted uh, to a journal near you soon. Um, so the unsaturated aliphatic sulfur compounds are enriched in the microlayer. Uh, we, we see the, um, potential linkages with sulfolipids. Um, those surface tension depressions are, are associated with those compounds. And I think we need to pursue this further. There have been a few studies of untargeted um, uh, molecular composition of the microlayer, uh, but I haven't seen many that link uh, uh, surface tension measurements or surface activity. 
Uh, so that's an, an area for uh, future work. There are lots of other ways that we can perform these untargeted analyses. I showed you a technique called negative electrospray um, Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry. We can look at the positive mode and we can do uh, lipid or met metabolomics using LC mass spectrometry. Those would provide us some more definitive structures, probably fewer compounds, but, but maybe some structures and links to sources that would be valuable. And, and multi-proxy approaches are, are going to be really valuable uh, for bringing in a lot of the uh, biological information that we can get from next generation sequencing as well as linking with some of the biomarker compounds uh, that others have measured uh, to really round out our understanding of surfactant properties and composition in the microlayer. So um, I'll stop there and take any questions that you guys have. Uh, after I acknowledge funding and, and some, some assistance from uh, folks uh, uh, who helped us with our sampling. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was fascinating. And so just as a reminder for anybody who came in late, we would love questions. You do have to enter them in the chat and I'll just be reading them out loud so Andrew can be focused on answering your questions and not having to also read the chat at the same time. So we already have one question, which is how large a percent of surface tension reduction due to organics did you observe? So you said it was reduced, but essentially how much was it reduced? That is a great question. So um, let me see. We're not looking at large surface tension reductions. Um, I have the figure up here. Uh, so th this gives you an idea of the reductions that we're we're observing. Uh, so we're we were looking at values going from seventy four to seventy three, something on those ranges. I I hope that answered what what the speaker was, or questioner was getting at. Another question is how would the observed chemistry of the surface microlayer change under ice? And if you haven't done any work under ice, if you can just say what other people have done or just speculate on what you think might happen. Can you repeat that? Sure, how would the observed it. chemistry of the sea surface microlayer be different in ice covered regions? So under ice, do you still have a sea surface microlayer? And if so, what would the chemistry be like or in partially ice covered regions? Yeah, so adjacent to the ice, um, yes, I would think that you would still have a sea surface microlayer, and I don't think that the observations on the composition would change significantly. I don't, I haven't done any work in polar regions to know specifically, uh, but that would be my guess is that you would observe the same types of trends. Another question, is what fraction of the total DOM does your extraction scheme provide? That's and then there's a follow-up question. So I'll just give you both so you can answer them. So one is what fraction do you get? And then what about what you're missing? Do you think there okay. could be compounds that are really even more functionalized in the missing part? It's a great question. And that's a, a holy grail uh, for all this stuff is, is how much are you actually characterizing and how um, how does it relate to the organic carbon pool? Um, the solid phase extraction process that we use is is PPL extraction, uh, and that has been shown to 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 um, retain forty two to sixty percent is the number that that often gets um, uh, cited of the organic carbon. Now, Amanda Frosser's group has has taken a look at different um, uh, solid phase extraction cartridges, and they've actually shown that surfactant activity um, is best characterized using something called an MV18 uh, uh, or an MV carb solid phase extraction cartridge. So we've since switched to using them. Um, and and the, the second part of the person's question was, um, it, uh, what is met being missed. So these cartridges tend to pick up what people refer to as the, uh, it's kind of oxymoronic, the hydrophobic portion of the dissolved organic matter. Uh, so what 
passes through the cartridge tends to be low molecular weight compounds that are really highly polar, really small um, acids uh, and, and other really polar molecules. Could those be contributing absolutely to the, to the microlayer? Yes. Um, and so um, does that, what does that mean for the implications? Well, um, you know, certainly tech, techniques and strategies that can characterize those compounds and their relationships would need to be developed. The challenge with this particular technique and any of these uh, mass spec techniques is if you're going to use an, a liquid form ionization, salts are a real problem. And, and the, what happens when you put your sample through these cartridges, your main, your main objective is to get rid of salts and your secondary objective is to concentrate your sample. And so as you get rid of your salts, you're losing some of these compounds that are potentially worth characterizing. And so absolutely any strategies that can get to characterizing those things and their relationships with surface tension should also be pursued. I don't have a solution right this second though. <laughs> We'll stay tuned, maybe another time. We're just going to take one more question now because we want to have time for Sarah's talk and plenty of questions. But then in the overall discussion, we can come back to more questions. So the last question for now, it's a nice general question to end on, which is, did anything in your work on the micro layer really surprise you? And especially the question I want to just notice, you've sampled from these four different sites, you've sampled, you know, presumably other places as well. So what has been a surprising finding? Sure, and uh, while I'm answering this, I'll, I'll I'll mention that we use the glass plate uh, technique. I see that as a, um, uh, a a question there in the chat. Now that I can see the chat, what surprised me the abundance of these sulfur-containing lipid compounds. When we we thought about uh, the uh, when about amphiphilic compounds, and when we think about lipid compounds, we think about phospholipids, and not sulfolipids. That was kind of new to me, so that surprised me. Um, it may not have surprised somebody else who's more familiar with the, the lipidome, um, but that was surprising. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. And as I said, there'll be more chance to ask Andrew questions as well as Luke and Sarah after, after Sarah's talk. So our second speaker is Sarah Brooks, who's a professor at Texas A&M and also the director of the Center for Atmospheric Chemistry in the Environment there. She studies aerosols and their connections to clouds and ecosystems. And today we'll specifically be talking about the sea surface microlayer. She got her PhD from the University of Colorado and did a postdoc at Colorado State University before starting at Texas A&M. And thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Um, thanks for the opportunity to join this group. I wanna talk about a different application now. Um, I wanna talk about the influence or potential influence of components of the sea surface microlayer on cloud formation. Okay, so um, we are all somewhat familiar with marine aerosols. Uh, so briefly, there are so many different um, sources in the ocean. Primarily, we think about wave breaking, and then in terms of secondary organic aerosols, uh, we can also have particles formed from initial emissions of, the, of gas phase components, like our famous dimethyl sulfide, um, which can then undergo reactions in the atmosphere and become what we refer to as secondary organic aerosol. So I am actually more interested in the primary aerosols today, um, which can be injected into the atmosphere through bubble bursting and then become what we call cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, and if you're not uh, aerosol and cloud folks, um, what we need to know is that all aerosol clouds form on a seed uh, or some nucleus that helps. Uh, if we're talking about warm drop of clouds, CCN is what we need. And I'll speak some more about that. And then another day we could talk about ice nucleating particles, which are the catalysts for ice crystals. Okay, so there are many um, different sources um, of and different compositions um, within the marine ecosystem. And again, we heard a lot about that before. Um, so here, just to bring that home, I like to look at these pictures. Um, this is some work led by Dan Thornton. 
and um, we're looking at various com biological components of the sea surface microlayer. And this is really just to, again, impress upon us the diversity of potential compositions um, that we need to study uh, in terms of clouds. So if you're looking uh, briefly at the first image there by the one, you can see a, a transparent exopolymeric particle. Um, there are also empty diatom fustules. There are you know, various things in here, lots of different things. There's a full diatom over in four, um, and some particles, of course, that we can't even identify. And then, of course, beyond all of this, we also have dissolved organic matter. Okay, so there's a lot going on in that microlayer. And I was pleased to get to be part of the NASA NEAMS project, uh, where we tried to understand the connection between these very complicated uh, marine systems and the aerosols um, that for, that may form on them. So NAMES is, is what we refer to as an Earth Venture System. So it was a full, very large project led by Mike Berenfeld. And over the course of five years, there were four month-long cruises in the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, there were also flights of the NASA C-130. Um, and so the, uh, there's just so much that could be learned. We're going to focus on the clouds today. So uh, just as a little preamble, um, I think this group is going to be rather familiar with the cloud hypothesis. And I now I want to think of it as a saga. Uh, so back in 1987, um, Carlson, Lovelock, Andre, and Warren proposed this really fascinating link between marine biota and climate. Um, and it, of course, was focused on DMS as a major gas precursor for the aerosols and the clouds. Well, um, that was very creative. Um, and there's probably a lot of information there. Um, and, but then scientists went out and tried to prove the CLAW hypothesis. Uh, and many efforts were made to try to prove the CLAW hypothesis. Um, which got us up to 2011, um, which is a point where Patricia Quinn wrote a very compelling article against the CLAW hypothesis and basically said CLAW is dead um, because there was not compelling field evidence that the aerosol and CCN measurements um, really were driven by the DMS. Couldn't do it. Couldn't, couldn't make this, um, this, this good connection. And so that's, that's where, uh, when we entered names in 2015, that's sort of where we were. The CLAW um, wasn't fully satisfying, satisfied by observations. It wasn't fully dead yet either. And so it was like this thing that we needed to understand more. It just wouldn't go away. So lucky, oh, and we'll need to know a few more details on what exactly I mean when I say uh, CCN. So here are the critical features of a great cloud forming aerosol if you're not familiar. Um, if you know the aerosol's composition and size, you can predict its ability to act as CCN. And by activated CCN, I mean a droplet that's going to then grow and spontaneously thermodynamically grow larger and larger. And if conditions don't change, it's going to rain right out. All right, so what I need to know um, if I have the droplet diameter and I have the water vapor supersaturation, or if you don't like that, think relative humidity is 100% when supersaturation is zero. Um, I can predict uh, this Kohler curve, and I then look and see what is the critical diameter. So once I've hit the critical diameter, I'm I'm a I'm a cloud drop. I'm ready. Um, that happens at a critical supersaturation. So the key is to find this point. And as you can see, if I know, again, my size and my composition, I can pinpoint the critical point. These are ammonium sulfate particles, for example. And what we see is the small particles require a higher saturation. As the particle gets bigger or the initial particle size is bigger, the required saturation is lower, the required diameter does shift a bit larger. 
um, and, so, and that carries on for size. Composition um, also has an effect. It's a little more complicated. Um, but the key is, if you know the composition and the size, you can calculate the CCN ability. Okay, so during this names project, which the ship was the RV Atlantis, and here's one of my graduate students um, installing our, our, well, this is actually Lynn Russell's inlet from Scripps. Um, Melissa's helping to install, we operated off that inlet. Um, we conducted cloud condensation nuclei measurements. Here's the instrument itself, um, where we can basically identify the concentration of particles that, are, that activate and become cloud drops as a function of the supersaturation. We were not the only group doing this. So as a team, NAMES had plenty of CCN measurements, which is why we were really able to get at some of these details. So the Bates and Quinn measurements were also taken. Uh, from on board the ship, and then Rich Moore led CCN measurements from the C-130 aircraft aloft. And finally, um, my graduate student, uh, Brianna Henriksen, whose work I'm featuring here, um, went the extra mile and actually collected sea surface microlayer samples so that she could look at more specific details and do look at the CCN activation at home. Okay, and so our questions were, um, how does the sea surface microlayer provide aerosols or does it provide a significant amount? Um, to figure that out, we went and you can see if you're sea surface microlayer folks, um, on this cruise, our strategy was a screen rather than a glass plate, which was um, probably safer though, has some caveats as well. Uh, all right, and um, we wanted to answer what, what were the chemical components of the sea surface microlayer that specifically contributed to cloud forming aerosols. And, you know, is the cloud formation driven by salts or, or, or is it, or will the organics um, play a large role? And I really appreciate Andrew's careful look at organics. I'm going to look at very broad categories of organics here, uh, but there have been hypotheses that the presence of lots of organics in the sea surface microlayer due to biological activities would have a big role in, in CCN activation, and yet that was something that needed to be further investigated. So the sea surface microlayer collection occurred on two of the four NAMES cruises, and what's important is just that we selected high chlorophyll stations and low chlorophyll stations um, as identified by these stars here, okay. And then this is this is how you can get at the gory details of what's really driving the CCN activity. So as promised, I said if we know the size and size and composition, we can calculate our CCN activity. Well, there's a handy related metric that we're going to use to look at that. Um, and that is the kappa parameter. Um, and you, again, this is something you may be very familiar with. If not, just think of this um, as our single, uh, single variable for predicting CCN activation and really how the efficiency of being a cloud droplet former. All right, so um, here we have our kappa and we can get it two ways, which we did do during names. So first of all, if you're, doing direct CCN measurements, you can take those measurements and, cal and get a kappa. Okay, and then we also can take other more fundamental, fundamental measurements and derive a kappa. And that can test our understanding between these fundamentals and the CCN activation. So specifically, um, you can see that as, as our graph showed us, the dry diameter, critical dry diameter, which we indicated in our color curve graph, is going to correspond to a critical saturation ratio, um, which is the amount of water. <clears throat> Pardon to change the units a little there. Um, but that's going to vary with the surface tension of the water, as well as the molar mass of the water and surfactant and the density of the solution of water and surfactant. 
Okay, and so um, the so let me just move forward before I do that. Um, maybe if that's a lot to take in, let's look at a theoretical study. Um, the next step you need in understanding kappa is really just to, to understand that in broad terms, um, higher kappa values equate with more effective cloud formers. And so here are some examples mapped out um, in, a in a nice early work by Petters and Kreinweiss. And as a function of dry diameter, if you want to look at the critical supersaturation, um, you can see that the large kappa values are actually on the left-hand side of my screen. And these are my inorganic. So I have uh, ammonium nitrate, for example, is in this orangey mustard color. I didn't pick the color scheme myself here. Um, and as I move to the other end of the graph, we have lower kappa values, which are less effective. And these, for example, are your ful fulvic acids. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's our estimator of good and bad in gr gross terms cloud formers. So now here's what we did to make the most of this sea surface microlayer sampling. Um, again, we wanted to measure CCN activation directly. So we brought our CCN counter home that off the ship um, and measured CCN values. And then you can use that to get kappa. So we consider that our measured kappa. And the other thing we can do is get our surface tension with a tensiometer, uh, our composition with uh, VOC, TOC, and IC, um, and then go ahead and calculate um, a kappa and compare these two. A critical piece in our assessing, since our, remember our science goal was to understand the importance or lack of importance of organics, um, which had been such a conundrum for a long time. And so um, we did this analysis on two types of samples, our straight SML samples, and then also some desalinated samples. Um, and why would we do that when we know salt, well, we know salts are important, um, and we were we wanted to see what the signal was in terms of CCN um, with the outside of this really large sort of elephant in the room, which is the salts. Okay, so here we go. So in this plot, we have the hydroscopic parameters, that is the kappas um, from a bunch of samples. I know there's a lot going on here, so I'll move slowly. Um, we have these four representative stations with high and low chlorophyll, uh, something to look at. Um, and then we are looking at the critical diameter, that is how big does the drop have to be to activate, um, and then also the kappa. Okay, and so um, in here what we see, uh, the four colors um, do represent um, what the critical diameter is under different humidity conditions. And for our purposes, what you can see is they're all lower than this value up here. Okay, well, this guy is the desalinated. Um, this is the desalinated critical diameter and the desalinated kappa. So in a way, the first thing we note is when you take the salts out, at all the stations, what we see is when we remove we remove the cap we remove the salts, we reduce the kappa. That's just telling us that in fact, yes, the salts um, are the you know contributing most of the uh, CCN activity here. So when we remove the salts, the remaining organics um, are a lot less efficient at CCN. Okay. All right, well, they're a lot less efficient, the remaining organics, but they're not, but there is some CCN activity remaining, uh, and we wanted to match then the CCN that we observed um, with the theoretical calculations, changing the composition. So here, we didn't have beautiful high resolution chemical measurements, so we decided to choose representative chemical compositions and see which of these fit the data the best. 
Um, and what's important here is the enormous range, and this may be unsurprising, um, but it, the enormous range in molecular weight is important. Um, and so we go all the way from glucose, where you have a unit as small as 180 grams per mole, um, up through these larger materials to Rubisco, um, but which has a molecular weight of 560,000 5, grams per mole. Um, if you're not familiar with Rubisco, um, it's a very common protein. Um, it's an enzyme that's part of photosystem two, and so you'd expect to see it um, in chlorophyll, or, or I'm sorry, in phytoplankton, um, and in the sea surface microlayer, um, you would expect to see it um, more concentrated than below, although that is not part of this study. All right, so those are our, those are our example chemical compositions. And then we decided to compare measurements to predictions and see basically which composition was the best. Um, and this will give us an idea of what assumptions for organic um, are the best. All right, so in the top panels, again, plenty going on in my graphs. So I, now I have my critical diameter on the x-axis and my cap, cap of values on the y-axis. Okay, um, and the untouched sea surface microlayer samples um, just re-aerosolized and measured for their CCN activity. Those are in the solid dark blue. Okay, so those are in the top row and we're comparing them to that gray bar there. So there are plenty of uncertainties. And in fact, even the, the gray is just the calculated, calculated kappa for seawater. Okay, recognizing that there are, of course, um, many salts in seawater. Um, and so, and um, we could have done, mm, I guess we could have done instant ocean, um, but just to be as completely honest as possible, we went from the highest possible kappa for seawater to the lowest. That gives us a range. And so that's a, that's a really large target there. And then in the bottom panels, before I forget, our desalination process was imperfect. And so the salt is reduced, but we did use ion chromatography to um, figure out how much salt was remaining in our samples. Um, and that's what you see in the gray panel down here. Okay, so we're trying, so the gray panel is our target. Um, the good news is in the top panels, um, we reach, we achieve that target. Um, which means that for salts, we understand, we have a pretty good handle on what's going on, um, which also means that, yes, there are the, the organic component is in here, but it's really not driving um, the overall kappa calculation. In contrast, uh, we, our initial uh, calculations for organics were not so, were not as strong. And you see those in D, E, and F. Uh, where we looked at the 6-glucose, the humic acid, um, and the rubisco, uh, and we looked at the others, but that's what's plotted here. Of the values that we looked at, for smaller molecules, we did not do so well, um, but we were very pleased to see that when you assume uh, that the organic is rubisco, um, you actually do, you are able to predict uh, the kappa um, with really good precision. Now, other very large proteins and enzymes could also um, have the same effect and probably do have the same effect. So that is something that we would wanna look into more. All right, so what that actually tells us um, is first of all, based on the CCN measurements of the sea surface microlayer, um, what we learn is that the sea surface microlayer cloud formation is really driven to great degree by salt. And um, that may not be exciting to everyone here. Um, for us, this was really was a very important study to conduct because had we known that, we wouldn't have had the great uh, saga uh, of the claw hypothesis. All right, so just to focus on the details for a bit. When we 
do the undergo the desalination, re removing the salts, our kappa values were reduced by 62%. So a very large degree of reduction. Now, the organics, on the other hand, certainly did not enhance cloud droplet formation. And by enhance, I mean they didn't allow formation under le less humid conditions. Um, but you would wonder if they were equivalent conditions to the salt, then that would be an indication that you could have um, thicker clouds and you could have denser clouds. And so that also would have been interesting. We didn't see that. Um, we did see that there's, they do, the organics do provide some, some effect. And of the organics that were, were analyzed, Rubisco, that is a very large biological uh, organic molecule from a, bio, from a biological system, um, was the very best fit. So um, the take home message from the sea surface, sea surface microlayer CCN measurements was that a very large amount of organic material only has a small impact on CCN activation. So, oh my gosh, that shows you how it was so frustrating um, for the many field measurements going out and measuring CCN activity and trying to connect it to um, organic composition. Okay, taking a step back, um, this we, the NAMES project also did learn um, a, lo a lot about CCN in general, um, and particularly Trish Quinn wrote a really neat paper in 2019 um, show, showing that a significant, significant seasonal variation um, in the fraction of aerosols um, does arise from local marine sea spray. Uh, I didn't talk about transported aerosols at all here. Um, Transported aerosols is another complication um, to understanding where the CCN come from. Um, but when we are looking at uh, local sources and it's winter time, the, the DMS and therefore secondary organic aerosol actually gives you 50% of the total aerosol mass, um, which leads to CCN. And in other seasons, it's less, it's significant, but less than 20%. Uh, but again, uh, is not, in other words, claw is not completely dead. Taking all of our measurements together from names, we can say that the claw processes produce some of the clod forming aerosols after all, uh, but there are other organics that are important as well. And if you would want more details on that, uh, Mike Bernfeld and I and some others wrote um, a little bit of an overview um, of what was found during names. Okay. And um, that's um, all I have uh, for today. Um, it takes a great team, both locally at Texas A&M and um, the many um, collaborators who helped us during the NAMES project um, to make this happen. And with that, I will try to answer questions. Thank you so much. And already a question popped into the chat. So we'll start with that one, but just as a reminder, you can put your questions into the chat. In the first few minutes, there'll be questions specifically for Sarah on her excellent talk. Would you suspect DMS to play a larger role in the Southern Ocean? Is the question. Um, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I didn't do the DMS measurements, but no, I think, um, I, I think the overwhelming key here is that DMS uh, or secondary organic aerosols from DMS, as well as uniform organic aerosols from the microlayer, are all really underwhelming. <laughs> so um, I don't think that they will play a large role anywhere. I think if we're interested in this, the cloud formation, the salts are going to really overwhelm the signal everywhere on Earth. Other questions? Okay. No. How confident are you about the computed influence of the organics? You had just said that there were some uncertainties. So can you just expand a little bit? On that? Sure. So, um, so if you know 
the composition, the calculations are extremely accurate. Um, so the big uncertainty is what is that composition? Um, and that uh, is really an open question. So what I can say is um, our, measure, our measurement calculation comparison suggests that what's important here are, are very large organics. Uh, sorry if I'm insulting you by saying organics, but I'm talking about proteins and enzymes um, rather than broken down smaller materials. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question then, which is you talked about the, there were two names cruises, I think, that the sea surface microlayer layer was measured on. Did you see these same effects on both cruises? I didn't quite catch, maybe you mentioned it, if you were sharing the results from just one cruise or the combined effect of both of them. The, we didn't see any differences across the two cruises. Yeah, so let's see, it seemed to be pretty uniform. Thanks, yeah. Mm -hmm. One more, can you comment on the contribution of the organic compound to IN? So you didn't talk about the ice nuclei. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom, so I didn't talk about ice nuclei. <laughs> um, so I love this question. Another thing that I study is ice nucleation. Um, but uh, I didn't, so we, and we did do ice nucleation from the atmospheric side um, during names, but unfortunately, we didn't do direct measurements out of the sea surface microlayer. Um, and so I think the answer is no, I, I can't do that based on names data. Um, based on many other studies we've done, um, broadly speaking, organics tend to freeze at what we call the range of moderate ice nucleated particles. So that's like minus 20 to 25. And that is going to be a lot more variable. So that uh, the importance of that is going to be a lot more variable, which is to say if you have dust um, or continental aerosols of a number of varieties, they're going to um, freeze at maybe minus 10 or minus 15. Um, and so that makes most organics less important. Although Rubisco, incidentally, is an excellent um, ice nuclei. So that is an exception. And we got one more. Oh, one more. Sorry, I don't know if you're static. Are you saying that only salt made a large contribution to CCN? And what, and if so, then if salt is the largest, can you estimate what percentage contribution comes from the organic compounds? Oh, so I am saying that the salt was, was the most important part. Um, and organics there, okay, so with organics, what I did not do is consider, one should consider the um, secondary organic aerosol, the DMS route separately, and that would, that would, be, that would not be feasible with this experiment. Um, but overall, secondary organic aerosol plus these condensed phase microlayers could be an absolute most case, 50% um, in the winter time, um, but then much less, so typically, five to 10% even, yeah. Thank you. So now I'll open up the questions more generally to all three panelists, and you can feel free to direct a question at a specific panelist, or if you just have any general questions about sea surface microlayer. Also, this is supposed to be a discussion, so unfortunately you can't talk for yourself, but if you put any words in the chat, just opinions, it doesn't even have to be questions, I or Jan or one of the panelists can read them aloud and comment on them or at least get them out of this space. Anybody wants to start? Yeah, and if the panelists can put, you know, there's some technicalities with WebEx that make it tricky, but if everybody can put their cameras on of the panelists, that would be great. And if not, that's fine too. Yeah, I'm here. I just can't put my camera back on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I might start it off then with a general a general question for any of the panelists, or really for all three of you. We've all heard about great work from modeling to specific studies. What if you could design your dream study, whether it be field work or modeling, a composition? What parameters if you really wanted to study the sea surface microlayer? And maybe, of course, it depends what 
question you have for the sea surface microlayer, but what would your dream study look like if funding wasn't a consideration? Whichever of you has an answer first is welcome to go first. Okay, I'll start. Um, you guys, you guys, feel free to improve on what I say. Um, so I think we all know that the, a really big challenge in the sea surface microlayer is it's enormously broad size de uh, definition, right? So if we have sometimes it's one micron diameter or thickness, and sometimes it's a thousand microns in thickness. Um, and I think that that's um, that is obviously convoluting lots of the results, you know, that we have. And I love the question about what does it look like um, under ice. Um, and so I would like to see uh, a study where we look at well, since you said I can have all the money in the world, I would we I would like several. I'd like to see a glass plate and a drum um, and a screen um, and just intercompare the results from several different techniques. And then, of course, composition is important, and I, so many things are important. So surface tension is important, and we did it. Um, Andrew, I think, did it better. Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, I, I, would, I would add some. Oh, good. Okay. So, uh, uh, like, we keep talking about the static surface tension. Does it resonate on your side, or it's only on my side that it's echoing? It echoes a bit, but I think we can understand, or we could try to have everybody mute other than you, Luke, while you talk. Okay. Is it better now? Oh, ooh, great. Um, so we we talk about static surface tension but when you have any sorts of uh, water contamination you have also dynamic effects like uh, so the the so you're going to have gradient in surface tension that are induced by the the molecules at the surface or 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 any sorts of uh, uh, contamination and and that is like widely not characterized uh, it's it's hard enough in an idealized lab setting and so in the field it becomes quite complicated and that's part also of the challenge in modeling these processes and predicting how it's going to change the bursting process and, and all of that. And so uh, I think that's that should be part of this idealized study um, of like how, how can we better think in terms of connecting models. And, and I think about like really mechanistic small scale model and whatever can be observed in the field and whatever can be done in the lab. Still muted, Andrew. Am I still muted? Now we hear you. Okay. Uh, yeah. If I if I I can just build on that, then um, pairing a, a lot of these measurements, so the, the gas exchange measurements and gas transfer velocities with the dynamic surface tension that Luke once measured in the field rather than brought home to lab, which I agree will um, improve things, would, would really just kind of link everything and, and eliminate some uncertainties between some of these um, unnecessary kind of limitations that we have with our measurements. Any questions in the chat? Broad scale questions from. We do while people are thinking of their questions for all the panelists. We did get one last question. I think it was directed at you, Sarah, which mm -hmm. said, would you agree that models should only take salts in consideration to model CCN? I mean, I, I would say no. I, I did over I did emphasize that the salts um, were really important 
and are the most important. Um, but there is this variable 20%, go up to 50% occasionally going up and down. Um, so ideally, um, I would still keep that organic component in my model if I could. Yeah, and, and to, uh, to connect on this, uh, if I, I mean, salt are mostly going to be above 100 nanometers particles. And below that, if I understand correctly, the uh, several papers, like it's been shown that it's mostly organics, uh, like when you are in the like smaller size range. And so if you, if these ones are important, then you certainly need them. You're muted, Sarah. Sorry. It's so awkward with all the muting and unmuting. Okay, sorry, sorry. No, I like, uh, that's a really good point, Look, um, uh, Definitely new particle formation can be important as well. Uh, bef they, particles do have to grow to be about 25 nanometers um, before they can start to activate as CCN. Um, so the very smallest, the very initially formed particles um, don't, won't matter. Um, but still, they grow quickly enough that that can be a, a significant chunk, especially if you're considering localized effects. So, Thanks. C can you elaborate on this a little bit? Because this has, to me, always been a, not something that's super clear in my mind on, on like how the different sizes are important. And I... Like, I tended to focus on salt because that's something I can understand from fluid mechanics and drops, and then you can make a link between the drop and the salt. And organics was more difficult because you don't have direct link. But I very much like your last answer. So if you could elaborate on this. A little oh, bit. Uh, okay, sure. So, um, okay, so, uh, so new particle formation, of course, is on the order of molecule, you know, what hundreds of molecules put together. Aerosols, as aerosol scientists, we can't really measure until we're at about a nanometer diameter. Okay. Um, so we, but, but, but we know we have many. So when we talk about new particle formation, we're thinking about these nanometer sized particles. They are very small. Um, and so I say they're not important for CCN. Um, because if we went back to, to that um, curve that I showed with the critical diameter and critical um, supersaturation, uh, the smallest size that matters under supersaturations that you're going to get in a marine boundary layer, um, the small thing that you don't, basically the y-axis is too high for anything until you're about a 20 nanometer diameter. And so between what, so if you think about that in terms of volume and adding takes, I don't have good calculation on this, but it takes a lot to get from a one nanometer particle to a 20 nanometer particle. And in 20 nanometer, 20, we measure at 25 nanometers. Um, and even only a small concentration of 25 nanometer particles are good CCN. So you're, there is a gap actually between new particle formation. Um, so, uh, sorry if I'm circling around, but you get lots of aerosols for new particle formation, but you don't get lots of cloud forming aerosols until those are bigger. So. And that's actually based, yeah, maybe that's enough. <laughs> It's good to say. Well, it's just that that's, I mean, that's, that's based on the curvature effect. So um, the equilibrium vapor pressure over a curved surface is different than over a flat surface. Um, and for tiny particles, that curvature is just too severe. And yeah, that's all I said. Uh, thanks. So, yeah. so that, that, the all the ones you were talking about are the one that sort of nucleate right and and then need to grow but 
what about the solid biological maybe organic is the wrong word i might be using the wrong word but you also have emission like primary emissions right of of particles that are not sold that could be in the like range 10 nanometer to 100 nanometer no yeah that's that's a fair point um let's see so the work i showed today would be insensitive to that which is not mean that it's not important um so if you have a solid uh so solids aren't going to you know become solution droplets and take up water but they can be coated in which case um they can take up water and so 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 they can also play a role they could play they could potentially play a role my my if my impression is you'll have less concentration of things like that i have done other work on uh, continental work on pollen grains and pollen plays a, can, can contribute a substantial concentration of ccn active cloud formers uh, in a local to regional scale um, but i don't think there's so many primary fra fragments of primary biological chunks of material i do think just kicking up the solution drops that we're talking about those those would be important. Thanks. Thanks a lot. There was a question about that. You mentioned, Sarah, how the organic part was most important in the winter. And the question was why, if it was a direct biological productivity, wouldn't you expect it to be lower in the winter than it may be a more productive season? Oh, and that has, that has, that actually has to do with wind speed. I believe. So the aerosol production is higher when, when there's more wind. Um, and that, that plays a more of a contributing role. Um, at least that, that's what was found in that study is that there, that was more of a contributing role than the composition. And I will see, yeah, I did, didn't, we couldn't address that with the sea surface micro layer study, of course. I'd like to ask a question if I can. Maybe that would be fun. Andrew's not getting the guy. So I really wanted to hear more from you. Um, and I have a really general question, if I may, uh, which is in your untargeted approach, I know they asked you what surprises you found, but did you find compositions using the untargeted approach that you wouldn't have found otherwise? And what were they? You have to unmute. I think you're muted. Andrew, check your audio settings and make sure you're connected to a headset or to your computer's microphone. Make sure you're connected to the right one, whichever one. It looks like you're using your computer now because you are unmuted. There are a couple of follow-up questions in the chat, Rachel, if you want to move on with those while we get Andrew back online with sound. Yes, I was about to do that. Okay, can you just read it, Sarah? That might be easier than me reading it out okay. loud. Um, okay, big question. Thanks for this big question. Okay, when, it, when imaging impacted course mode SSA at 90% humidity, which is a solution drop, um, the vast majority have the same dark brown edges. 
Okay, oh, implying a uniform high surface tension, but a small percentage have brighter edges, less surface tension. Okay. Um, is the surface microlayer spatially inhomogeneous? Wow, I love this question. I want someone else to answer it. Um, is 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 the is the surface microlayer spatially inhomogeneous, such that it is locally much thicker when Langmuir roads lead to surface convergence, um, and that breaking waves in such small areas are enriched in organics um, and have lower surface tension. Um, also imaged as flat spherical droplets. So um, I think that I wish you were designing the experiment because now I've read this question, I see we need a lot more sampling um, for me to even start to answer this question. Um, so that the answer is really just, I don't know. This... <laughs> Luke, do you want to take this one? <laughs> Andrew, if you're with us. Yeah, I'm happy to say something about it. Uh, I'm not going to be able to answer your question, but I'll just add a few more on top of your question. I, I think it has to be spatially varying, like as the waves are breaking, as you have like strong turbulence mixing, it can't be like just like a nice static layer of some constant value. It has to be moving. And and I don't know what it means in terms of concentration, in terms of everything we have been talking, but that I would imagine that it's it's changing in space and time. And I would very much like to know how and uh but I, I, I don't know. I, I would think we could look at this in idealized laboratory settings. Um that's probably much more feasible than than thinking about doing it in the field. Um yeah. Am I am I audible now? Okay. Yes, perfect. I missed that question because I was trying to figure out my technology, so I don't know that I have an answer for it. But I can circle back to Sarah's question for me, um, and the answer is yes. the The untargeted approach by design is going to find other stuff. Um, you know, when I talk about targeted approaches, I'm thinking of, you know, you have standards. We know right. carbohydrates that we would be looking for. We know amino acids. We have the sweep of fatty acid compounds that you would typically see in a marine DOM sample or a particulate sample and so forth. And <clears throat> this the dissolved organic matter community has known this for a, a long time, uh, but they haven't had necessarily the ability to look for these other compounds until you know the 2000s when some of these techniques started coming online where you can just run a sample and have the resolution be high enough to identify, you know, some type of a molecular formula. Now, the, the challenge is finding structures of these compounds. <clears throat> and you would need a different approach for from than what I have used. For that, you would need, to, so what we detect are singly charged ions, and that just gives you kind of the molecular form, or the, the mass, and then you can calculate a molecular formula. If you can isolate one of those tiny peaks, and break it up into pieces, then you can start to build the structures of the compounds and and start to look at what they might um, look like on from a structural perspective and link them back to like a source. If you have a database of these types of structures from say cultures of algae or something like that. And <clears throat> the, the challenge is, is that what we see in the organic pool in a water column or in the microlayer uh, is maybe biologically derived. In fact, probably right out in the middle of the ocean, it, it's all biologically derived. But pretty much immediately, once something leaves a cell structure, 
it's transformed into new compounds. And those are all, all those dots that you're looking at on my diagrams represent derivatives of those compounds, most likely, rather than, say, a, a specific lipid or a specific amino acid. So it didn't surprise me in particular because I spend my time looking at these things. <laughs> um, but that's the long-winded answer to your question. Okay, thanks. I have a follow-up that may be naive, so forgive me. Um, so there are, I've have seen in the literature some interesting things about trying to figure out if your carbon is labile and maybe and formed recently versus refractory and comes you know from upwelling processes. And so does your technique uh, would you be sensitive to to being able to differentiate between those, or is everything that you're looking at labile? Um. No, not everything that we look at is labile. Uh, can we tell, distinguish what is labile and what is not labile? No, we can, we can make some kind of broad scale kind of guesses, um, but without doing, you know, for first of all, labile to what? Labile to photochemistry, labile to microbi microbes, labeled to what kind of microbes and, and all these kinds of questions become important. Um, from a microbial perspective, people think, I, at some point I talked about CRAM, carboxyl rich allocyclic molecules. And people kind of think that that stuff ends up being non-labile based on the fact that it accumulates and that it's present in every seawater sample that you can find. Um, it, from to add to that, you know, I didn't talk much about it today, but you down in kind of the lower left part corner of that that diagram would be where you would expect to see soot and char and things yeah. like that. People would expect that to be uh, pretty pretty stable. But can you make can you to conduct an analysis and say label or not label? I I would be. I would have, if I was the reviewer, you would have a hard time. <laughs> you would time do that. Me. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Any last questions? Makes sense that we end a little early because we had Luke's talk last time. So, well, I'd just like to thank all our speakers again and thank everyone who joined us coming back for our part two. And it's just been really great to talk about the sea surface microlayer with all of you. The recordings will be posted on the SOLAS website. So if you either want to hear it all again, or you have colleagues who weren't able to join us, but would like to hear it, you can just point them. I'm not quite sure when they'll appear, but sometime soon, those will pop up there. And thank you very much. Okay, thanks for hosting. Bye-bye guys.